Hey there everybody, Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of Questions and Answers. Today is Sunday, June the 9th. And we've got uh, actually got some really good questions this week. So I'm going to try and get to a little more than I normally do. I usually try to do, you know, 10 or a dozen or so. I have a few more than that today. A couple actually should be fairly quick, but they're good questions nonetheless. So let's get right into it, right? So the first one is from Alex L. Alex lists, lists off a bunch of albums here. Uh, 2017 Deep Purple Infinite. 2018 Uriah Heap Living the Dream, 2018 Saxon Thunderbolt, 2018 Judas Priest Firepower, 2019 White Snake Flesh and Blood. And he says, they're all excellent. What's going on these days? Not any sign of slowing down. To me, this is like the new wave of British heavy metal again. What do you think? And by the way, in my opinion, David Coverdale's voice sounds better now on Flesh and Blood than 10 years ago on Good to Be Bad. Yeah, there's some classic bands out there right now that are putting out some of the best music of their career. Uh, all those ones you mentioned, excellent releases. These are bands who have been around for a million years. Uh, throw Sticks in there. Sticks' last album, The Mission, was fantastic a couple years ago. Uh, Except, last couple albums have been great. Uh, Flotsam and Jetsam, Overkill, so many like classic bands from the 70s, 80s who are still doing it and still really pumping out some good music. By the way, I'm on uh, just... Now that I hear the cars driving by, I'm actually at my backyard on my pool deck. I figured it's so gorgeous outside, why sit inside and record this? So enjoy the nice scenery. Okay, it's starting to get a little hot out, but it's uh, but it's definitely nice weather. So and yeah, I agree, Alex. Um, Coverdale sounds great on the new album, but then again, you know, he always sounds pretty good on the studio releases. You know, live it's usually hit or miss, but he's still trying his best. But I think he sounds really good on the new album, and I love the new White Snake album. From Spaghetti Lee El Douchebag. Hey, Pete, normally I would never ask more than one question a week, but since no one has brought it up, I feel I must. What are your thoughts on the Rob Halford cell phone kick? Peace, Spaghetti Lee. Um, you know, I didn't really read much about that other than I just kind of heard it from a couple people. You know, it gets a little ridiculous. I go to a lot of concerts, and I see a lot of people who are not paying attention to the bands at all, or they live the entire concert through their cell phones. And I can imagine, you know, geez, if I was up there on stage, man, and you see people right in the front row and all they're doing is holding up, you know, cell phones and taking pictures and video, that would kind of be a little annoying. I mean, I know it's impossible. You can't really do much about it. Although there are some bands and some venues out there that they will, they crack down and they will not let you to pull out your phone and record where they're taking a picture or video. So it's, a, it's and you may start seeing more of that because I know at times it can be distracting for the, uh, for the artists, especially when flashes are on and all that kind of stuff so i don't know i i wouldn't have thought that alfred would have do something like that but i guess you never know anybody can kind of like you know get unnerved by what someone's doing in the front row at any time so I'm not surprised it happened uh I'm, I'm surprised we don't hear more of that to be quite honest with you from nick you sophian you sophian hey pete thank you for your video this may be purely subjective but kind of interesting what do you believe constitutes a good album opener or a good intro to a song for me, it would be a song that sets the structure of the album like Wells of Souls from Candlemasses, Nightfall, or Highway Star. Intros for a song for me is a little musical journey like Disciples of the Watch by Testament, Helium, Electric Guy from Priest, Prologue, Twilight from UFO, or Rock Bottom. Thanks for your time. I mean, I firmly believe that a strong album, album opener is a great way to kind of get you into everything that's going to follow, right? And there's been so many great ones. I mean, you mentioned a, a bunch right here. Uh, how about Stand Up and Shout? All right, from Dio's Holy Diver album, Neon Knights from Heaven and Hell, Burn from the Burn album by Deep Purple, Where Eagles Dare from Iron Maiden on the Peace of Mind album. Those songs set the stage for the rest of the album to come, and they just get you. You know, because you tend to remember those ripping album openers, right? A lot, a lot of times, a lot more than the rest of the album. That always stands out. So yeah, it's an important thing. I think more bands need to pay more attention to that kickoff track because it's so important. Kevin Smith, Pete, serious question, in depth on why you don't like hair metal. <laughs> you know, I never said I didn't like hair metal. I, I don't like a lot of hair metal. There are some bands I don't mind too much. You know, for me, just hair metal always seemed really cheesy. I always gravitated towards more serious forms of metal. So, like when hair metal was all big, you know, I was much more into like thrash and classic metal stuff. I just find, you know, like I'll use Poison for an example, or you know, Motley Crue, or. Um, God, warrants. It's just silly music. And I understand it's lighthearted. It's meant to be kind of poppy. It's meant, it's like for the people who just, all they want to do is, you know, bang their head to tunes about chicks and drinking and driving fast cars and all that kind of stuff. But I just, 
it just never really grabbed me. And there are some bands that were considered part of the hair metal craze that I liked, but I liked them for like musicality reasons. Like I always like really like Doc. Okay, uh, sort of hair metally, but not. I always thought their music was a bit more serious, had more depth to it from a musical perspective. Great guitar work. Uh, Rat was another band that I never, you know, other than I was never a huge fan of this singer. Great guitar work, really complex arrangements, you know, well thought out songs. Uh, you know, I never minded Winger much. Again, great musicianship there. I, I could take Cinderella, take them or leave them, although I think they had a little more to offer. They, they were more of like a blues rock band, I think, who kind of went the whole glammy thing. So it's not that I hate hair metal. I just, to me, it's just like, it just, a lot of it seemed really cliche ridden and silly. And it just got ridiculous. And I think after a while it became more about the videos and the image and all that kind of stuff than about the music. And that was the sad thing about it. Um, but there obviously were a lot of great songs and some good, talented bands. But that was, you know what, that was a wave that kind of came and went. And uh, is what it is, right? From MBF78, who says he's relatively new to the channel. Um, and he's digging on some of the classic stuff that I'm introducing to him. Very, very cool. Uh, he has four quick questions he would love for me to answer, so I'm going to do them. He says, if you were to do a top ten list on a non-rock act, which would that be? Uh, I'd probably pick a jazz band, or a jazz fusion band specifically. So Miles Davis may be returning forever, my have an orchestra, weather report, something like that. Uh, if you were to do a top ten list for a foreign language, non-English act, which would it be? Probably someone like maybe PFM, Italian Proggers. Or maybe I go to Japan and do Kenso or something like that, you know. Uh, if you were to do a top ten list for a more recent act, which would that be? Probably like maybe Government Mule or Dream Theater or Symphony X, something like that. I've got all those in, in the works, so they'll be coming. And if you were to do a top ten list for a solo act, as in not a band, which would that be? Uh... Well, I already did an Elton John. I mean, a, well, Elton John would probably be the one. I did an, an Alice Cooper once. I've already kind of done that. Uh, but a, an Elton John is one that I do plan on doing. Uh, thanks for your attention, and forgive the inconvenience that this may cause. No inconvenience, MBF78. From Jamie Laszlo, have you ever given an album a one-star review, or do you feel it's best to skip these sorts of albums because our, too much negative energy goes into the review? Um, no, I've given plenty of one-star reviews. I've given... In fact, I think I've even given a zero-star review a couple times. But yeah, I've done plenty of one-star reviews. Here, here's my opinion on that. Um, you know, if I'm agreeing to re review an album, whether uh, I think it's great or not, I should say why, right? Uh, so I feel like if I'm going to give, and you know, I, and another question is going to come up that kind of covers this too. But um, if there's, if if I'm reviewing an album and I find some serious flaws in it. And it just doesn't work for me, whether it's because it's a style I don't really like or whether, you know, just the album is a mess either from a musical or songwriting or vocal perspective. What I want to do in my review is say, OK, this really is not very good. Here's why. And here's how I think it could be better. I think you owe that to the artist to give, and you know, because a lot of people are of the opinion. It's like, oh, if it's no good, I uh, better, you know, don't say anything. Right. Just don't review it. It's like, but, you know, the artist needs that feedback, whether it's good, bad, or ugly, right? So I try to say, okay, this didn't click with me. This is why it didn't work. Here's what I'm, I think might make it better in the future in hopes that the bands read it and say, okay, we'll take that to consideration. I read a lot of reviews out there by people who just like to bash stuff just to bash stuff. And, and there's, there's nobody's – that's not helping anybody other than, you, you know, you're scaring potential listeners away, uh, but you're not helping the bands, all right? Just you know, just by saying this this sucks. This sounds like shit. These guys should retire tomorrow. I mean, that's I mean, come on, that doesn't help anybody. From B M Bolt, hello Pete. My question is: If you think Black Sabbath are really retired for good, Ozzy can't seem to ever hang it up. Even if he did, maybe we can get a Tony Martin reunion. Doubt it would sell as well, though. Would like to see Iommi and Hughes work together some more. Um, you know, I don't know. It's you know, and speaking of Ozzy, I mean, he's God. His health has not been great lately. He just gets sick one thing after another. So he's had to cancel so many shows on this solo tour. Uh, I honestly, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, was the end the end? I'd like to think not. But and I know that um, Tony still wants to do something. But you know, Geezer's out playing that in that other band with Steve Stevens now. And you know, you know what the deal is with Bill Ward. And personally, I your last, you know, would there be a Tony Martin reunion? I kind of doubt it. I think. Uh, I think Tony kind of shit on, on Tony shit on the other Tony. 
uh, and I don't know if that'll ever happen again. I, I probably would think that I, I only Hughes thing would happen before anything else. I would love to see those two guys work together again because for me that really, really works. So, But we'll see. We'll see. Would I love to see more Black Sabbath? Hell yeah. But, uh, you know, I think Ozzy's winding down in his career, and, um, you know, I would love to see, like, one more big show with the original four would be awesome. Um, but, you know, you never know. From uh, Gear Ladden Lad, my question for the next show is, could you do a rig rundown, so to speak? Starting with your guitars, what are the pickups and any other distinguishing features for each instrument? Also, could we get a look at your amps? And finally, could you show the effects that you use, what pedals you have, or any rack mount effects? All right, well, since I'm outside, obviously I can't show you. Uh, maybe for the next show I will uh, do a quick little camera thing. But uh, basically what I have for guitars, so I've got three Gibson Les Pauls. I've got a um, 2014... Standard, no, sorry, 2013 standard, okay, with uh, burst bucker pickups, okay. I've got a 2014 classic, right? Or is that the traditional? I got to always seem to forget. Uh, I think it's, I think it's uh, the 2014 is the classic, okay, and that has uh, 57 pickups. That's a tobacco burst. Uh, the other one is a vintage sunburst, the standard, and then I have a 2015. Uh, gold top traditional, uh, and that one has burst bucker pickups in it. Love those three. I just I'm I'm kind of a Les Paul guy. So uh, in addition, I have an Epiphone Carina Flying V. I think most of you guys have seen that on the channel before. I've uh, I've shown that, um, as well as I have uh, two made in Mexico Fenders. I have a, uh, a Stratocaster with um, a pair of humbuckers in it and two single coils. And then I have a Telecaster, uh, which is a white Telecaster with stock pickups in it. That's what I got right now. I've, I've unloaded some uh, some guitars in, over the last year, but I plan on buying some more. I'm actually eyeing uh, a, a black, or sorry, ebony uh, Gibson SG Standard that I hope to get soon. Uh, I'd like to get a Paul Reed Smith at some point. And uh, I'd like to get a Butterscotch Telecaster, and I'd like to get a white Fender Strat with a rosewood, rosewood uh, fretboard. So that's kind of the things that, you know, are on my wish list, whether they happen anytime soon or not. We'll see. Uh, as far as amps, I have uh, uh, two tube amps. I have a, a little Marshall DSL-15, which I love to death. That's great. It's, you know, the, the smallest, well, not anymore, but when I bought it, that was the smallest Marshall uh, with, with a tube. Uh, it's a great amp. Great amp for rock, metal, and blues, man. It's just awesome. Uh, I have a Fender Blues Junior. Okay, that's uh, also a 15, 15 watt. That's great. That's I play that more for like clean stuff and straight blues and what have you. And then I've got a little uh, Orange Crush 20, which is the smallest amp out of the three. Um, and that's a solid state amp, but it's also the loudest by far of the three. Uh, and that's like a little portable thing. I bring that out to play on the, you know, out here on the deck or on the patio or I'll bring it into the living room or something like that. That's like my little portable thing when I don't feel like lugging the other. Even though the other amps are small, they're heavy, and I just like I leave them where they are. So I got the orange just to kind of bring around with me and stuff like that. As far as effects, so I've got a, uh, a Crybaby Wah, my staple. I've been using Crybaby Wahs since I first started playing, like in the early 80s. Um, I've got a MXR Univibe. I've got a uh, Jimi Hendrix Fuzz Face, little red one. I've got a uh, Digital Delay. I've got a Ibanez Tube Screamer. What else am I missing here? Oh, and I have a uh, Eddie Van Halen, uh, the Phaser. That's an awesome little pedal too. So you know, just a couple of pedals. I'm not a huge, huge pedal guy, but I like to have uh, my little, you know, little staple of stuff there. From uh, Amadeo Eichberg, compact disc format has many attributes, but one drawback is no album sides like LPs and cassettes. Albums like Tattoo You by the Stones, for example, has rock side one and mellow side two. What album side is your favorite from Best Color Name Bands, Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, and White Snake? Of course, you picked my favorite three bands. I'm sure you did that on purpose. Very cool of you. Uh, so this this is tough because there's a lot of really good ones. But I tried, and I have a couple ties here because I just couldn't make up my mind. So for Sabbath, uh, side one of the very first album. Really can't beat it. Even though that's not my favorite Sabbath album, and even though, like, you know, Paranoid, Master of Reality, Volume 4 and Sabbath Bloody Sabbath for me are like, you know, well, those first like five or six are just killer. Um, each one of their sides have for me like one kind of weakest track, right? So, but I think the, the first album, that first side is just pretty damn great, right? But also I think if um, side one of Mob Rules kills, crushes, 
and I had to throw that up there. That might be that might be even the better one. I mean, side one of Marvels. I wanted to put side one of Heaven and Hell, but you know, Lady Evil is a good song, but not one of my favorites on that album. But I, Mob Rules, man, side one, woof, kills. So on to Purple. So I think uh, you know, side one of In Rock is monstrous. But I also think, and it's my favorite album, as you know, but side one of Machine Head really, really cranks as well. No weak track there. In fact, there's a lot of great songs on there. So kind of a tie there. You know, side one of Burn also is really great. Uh, and as far as like Whitesnake, I think side one, and I didn't include the 1987 release because technically I think wasn't that released on CD first. I always thought of that as CD only, right? Um, I never had that on, or I did have it on LP actually. Yeah, that, so that might qualify. But I also think side one of Slide It In is massively great. So it's kind of a tie there. So side one of Slide It In versus side one of the self-titled 1987 release. Good question. From Raymond Kaiser. Pete, I hope you consider this an intelligent, thought-provoking question. Are record sales and concert attendance the only benchmark that should be used in determining a rock artist's greatness, or should it be something more? Please elaborate. Well, no. I mean, obviously, there's more to it than that. That's a big thing. Obviously, if, if people are buying a lot of your records, okay, and people are going to see you in droves live, obviously, they're liking you for a reason in most cases, right? But I think a lot of what also makes an artist great is the impact they've had on other bands and musicians. So I always take a lot of stock when you hear, and you hear it all the time like these days, you hear a lot of bands that have come out in like the 80s and the 90s and 2000s, you know, really talking about bands like Thin Lizzy and UFO and Sabbath and Purple and Rainbow as, you know, so important to what they, they've done in their careers. So I think you have to take into advantage, yeah, they were big sellers, People bought their albums and went to see them live because the songs are great, the music's great, the musicianship is great. Or in some cases, you know, maybe the theatricality of what they do was really cool, like in Kiss, you know, Alice Cooper. So you got all those elements. But I think the whole, the whole influence has a lot to do with it as well. You know, you can go, you can take that all the way down to the actual, you know, musicians, like you know, guitar players or what have you. So you've got some, you know, guitar players who are like solo artists who. You know, maybe they never were big sellers, but they were massively, massively influential to other musicians. So you got to take all of that into consideration on the greatness of a band or an artist, right? So it's not, it's not all about the sales. That's, that's very important. But um, it, the influence also has a lot to do with it. From MWO486, hello, Pete. I am curious to hear your opinion about excessive volume in concerts and even movies. I would think in the year 2019 that sound reinforcement would have graduated to the next level where you could still have a good amount of volume, but not to the extent that it can hurt the listener's ears. Obviously, I'm coming from a certain angle on this, but I'm interested in what you think. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I have a good friend who's uh, you know struggling with uh, tinnitus right now, and I actually know of a few, few people who have that. And it's like, um, yeah, shit's just too loud everywhere you go. You know, I even, I argue with my wife all the time. We're sitting watching, you know, a movie or TV in the house, and she's got the sound bar and the TV cranked up to, like, ungodly volume. I'm like, we're sitting five minutes away from, from the speakers. I'm like, do we really need to have it that loud? Um, and I have found a lot of concerts nowadays. I mean, I, you know, I've seen a lot of shows in my life, and I'll be the first to tell you, I probably didn't start wearing earplugs till like, maybe five or ten years ago. And uh, I even nowadays, I don't always wear them, but lately I have been. Basically, because I've seen people who have had, you know, hearing loss issues, and it's just shit's just too loud. It doesn't need to be that loud. I personally would rather be it just loud enough so you can hear everything clearly than to be bombastic. And you know, sometimes it's cool. You mentioned the movies. Sometimes it's cool going to like going to um, a movie theater and seeing, you know, this big special effects laden bombastic film and whatnot. But yeah, how much is is too much? You know, even like here, you know, I'm playing music at home or in the car. I don't play it as loud as I used to. I don't need to hear it at massive volumes. I, you know, how many times I, I go to the gym, I'm working at the gym every day, and I see these young kids who have, you know, the earplugs in, whether they're, you know, the Bluetooth or whether they're, you know, with cords, and they're listening to stuff on their phone or their iPods or whatever, and it's so loud, I can hear it. I walk by them, and I can hear it as if I'm listening to it. That's not good for their ears. I, when I play the iPod at the gym, I don't play it that loud. I just need to be able to hear it. I don't need just... I see people driving around their cars, and man, all you hear is this, the, it's, it's volume, volume, volume. Your ears are not going to last forever, folks. So, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I think that, um, you know, you got to watch it. It's, uh, bring those earplugs, folks. It's, conserve the eardrums. 
You will need them for the rest of your life. From Professor Whiskey Breath. Hey, Pete, great show as always. Professor Whiskey Breath. I wonder who that is. Rock critics can be both good and bad for music and for music fans. Do you, in your humble opinion, believe that with regard to the music that you and your viewers like, prog, fusion, metal, that music critics did more harm than good? Many great releases that I have loved for years took a beating by the usual suspects, and he names a few of them. Uh, also, how do you feel about the everybody can be a critic YouTube era? Thanks, and enjoy your whiskey responsibly. I do. Cool. You do that, professor. Um, yeah, I mean, everybody's a critic now, right? So I kind of alluded to before. There's a lot of writers out there. I see a lot of, especially a lot of really younger people reviewing music now, whether it's metal or prog or indie or pop or whatever the hell. And I think that everybody's trying to have an angle. They're trying to come up with a personality for themselves. And they're trying to be really cute with the way they review things. But sometimes I read a lot of these reviews and I'm like, you're not really saying anything about the music. You're not doing the band any kind of justice here. It's like you're trying to come across this character. And on the on the flip side, I see a lot of people that they seem to think it's funny. I'm going to review music now, and they have a really good time with bashing albums and bands, and just you know really ripping stuff a new asshole. And it's like, and and that's that's kind of lame. And yeah, you got people you got people popping up everywhere on YouTube, um, wanting to be review stuff. And, you know, just droning on and on about music and albums and whatnot. And some of them have a lot of good things to say and some have absolutely nothing to say. So, you know what? What it comes down to, a music reviewer, whether it's me or anybody else, our job and our responsibility to is to expose the music of the artist that we're talking about or covering to an audience of people that perhaps has never heard them before and to either inspire them to go out and check the music out or not, right? So I like to think that everybody's pairs of ears are differently. So like if it's something that I don't really like, I may tell you why and how it might be better. But I said, but you know what? Your mileage may vary. This might be something that you would like if you like this. I like to think that you have to give every reader, viewer, listener a chance to want to go explore the music on their own, regardless of what my opinion is. So I can only help guide you. That's kind of how I see it, okay? Um, but I know a lot of people on the internet, they really don't care about that. It's like they just, you know, I don't think their interest in the, the artists, okay, or in the potential consumer is there. All right. So I think a lot of people go on YouTube just to kind of make a name for themselves and, you know, they're going to make a lot of money doing this and I'll come up with some kind of character and, you know, and I'll, I'll be famous because I'm a cool guy and I can be funny and I've got this, you know, I'll come up with this weird personality and while I'm doing it, I'll talk about albums and I, I don't know. I see a lot of that. There's so many that do that. So you just got to find someone who's honest. I mean, I like to think that I'm kind of honest in what I do here. Um, some of you may not agree, and that's fine, but I, I do this, I don't do this to make millions for myself, or, you know, I've, I've already been a name in the industry for a long time. I do this to promote the, the music, and to promote music to you guys, so that you can go out and make a, you know, an educated decision on if it's something you want to buy and listen to and, and explore on your own. That's what it's all about. It's about promoting the music to everybody, and sharing this whole thing that we do. So, hope that answers your question. From Jay Hewitt, Welsh Phantom. Hey, Pete, inspired by your video of Real Turkeys from Bands You Love, I was thinking the following. There are bands whose entire catalogs I own and have always kind of steered away from certain albums that were considered relatively weak at the time of release. However, as the years progress and I've listened to the more popular albums over and over, out of needing something different to listen to, I have revisited the, the so-called weaker albums and now love them. For example, I now really appreciate No Prayer for Dying by Maiden or Nightlife by Thin Lizzy, although I really... Although I didn't really understand those records for years. Has this ever happened to you? And if so, do you have any examples or do turkeys just remain turkeys? Personally, I can now find good or lo in loads of albums I didn't rate previously. And why do you think this may be? Cheers from Wales, the land of budgie. Cheers. I need, a, I, need a, I need to wet my whistle after that one question. Jay Hewitt. Well, if you've been watching my channel here for a while, you know I did a show on how I decided to uh, revisit 80s Genesis and 80s Rush. Uh, because for many, many years, I basically, you know, was of the opinion that everything after um, Duke by Genesis was a total turkey. And, you know, everything from Grace Under, after Grace Under Pressure and up until like Test of, uh, uh, Test for Echo by Rush was not very good. And uh, actually not Test for Echo, the one right before that. 
you want to blank on the name. Anyway, um, and yeah, I, in revisiting those, they're actually pretty damn good. And again, why does that happen? I think because back in the day, I was a lot younger. I was into a lot heavier music, and I just did not appreciate kind of what was going on on those albums, which I have now learned to appreciate because I'm older, and they kind of sit with me a little bit better. So uh, same thing kind of like with the Rolling Stones. I always thought the Rolling Stones were crap growing up. Never liked them at all. I thought every album by them was a turkey. But in recent years, I love the Stones now. So I think it just depends on you go through changes in life. You get older, your your tastes kind of soften a little bit, okay? And you're more open to, to music that maybe 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, you thought was a turkey. So, From Tate Davis, hey Pete, great video as always. My question for next show revolves around Blackfoot. What in your opinion, what is your opinion on the two albums they released with Ken Hensley, Siago and Vertical Smiles? I am personally not much of a fan apart from a few songs. I found them to be too polished and poppy. I mean, they kind of are, but there's a lot of really good songs on both of those albums. Uh, I think it was a strange choice for Ken of a band to join, obviously. You know, how do you go from like Uriah Heep to Blackfoot? But, uh, you know, it, it kind of broadened their sound a little bit. Uh, obviously, the keyboards brought a little bit of a melodic element to the band. So, I don't, while I don't think those albums are as good as the couple that came before it, obviously, uh, I think there's plenty of strong material on those albums. And it's, uh, I revisit those from time to time. From Colston Veer. Hi, Pete. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. A friend of mine has a rule that he won't buy more than three albums by one band. His theory is that it is only very rarely that a band can maintain their very best creativity for more than that. What bands would you say I managed to do just that? Create more than three top-notch efforts, and for your top three favorite artists, what are their special three albums? I mean, we can go on and on all day with the question like this. I mean, come on. Zeppelin, The Who, Sabbath, Purple, UFO, Thin Lizzy. <laughs> Metallica, I mean, everyone I mentioned right there um, had more than three great albums. Rush, for God's sake, you know. So, I mean, I could do a whole show on that, but yeah, and I think we know what all those albums are. So, you know, my top three, you know, Deep Purple, right? So you got In Rock, Machine Head, well, In Rock, Fireball, Machine Head, and you can keep going from there. Uh, from Zeppelin, Jesus, Zeppelin, <laughs> one, two, and three, right? Uh, and then the, the rest of them, you know, um, Sabbath, Jesus, the first five, six, you know, Van Halen, the first three, four, uh, Rush, God, all the way up to Grace Under Pressure. For well, you know, even if you don't want to go that far, everything up to Moving Pictures, great. So a lot of bands, you know, and they may be in the minority. You know, we're, we're, when you're talking about thousands and thousands of, of known bands, probably the minority that had three or more classic albums in a row. But there's still quite a lot of them. And we could, you know, Leonard Skinner, we, I, we could probably do a whole show on bands that had three or more classic albums in a row. So I think there's a lot of instances there. From Sean Schmidt, I have a question. Why are American bands like Echelon, Illuvidar, Glass Hammer, Jam Carre, Discipline, Crack the Sky, Beer for Dolphins, Battle On, Mastermind, I can go on and on so rarely, if ever mentioned on your shows. You should do a show solely on American prog. I'm sure your viewers would love to dig into these bands. Well... If you've been following my channel for a while, you know that I already have in the pipeline to, to get to at some point uh, a show all on American Prague. I'm going to do one on Italian Prague, you know, all the different countries that were popular for having progressive rock music. Um, but I've, I mean, Christ, I've talked about Echolin and Glass Hammer. I've reviewed Glass Hammer's last however many albums uh, on this channel. I talk about them quite a bit. Uh, Discipline I've talked about. I just talked about uh, Mastermind on a recent show. Uh, Babylon was on one of my um, top prog albums of the 70s, the underground shows. Uh, you know, Jam Carre, we've mentioned a few times. I don't think I've ever talked about Beer for Dolphins, but I love them and Mike Keneally. Uh, Crack the Sky, really not very familiar with Crack the Sky. So, you know, you can't talk about every, every band. I, you know, I've done hundreds of shows on this channel. So before you start saying that I never cover anything, just because I haven't talked about some of these bands in the last two months doesn't mean I haven't talked about them. In the past, so you need to go investigate our playlist. A lot talked about a lot of these bands before, all right, and I will continue to do so. So, from Indie Cult 777, hey Pete, on most documentaries I see on your eye heap, they're often referred to as a poor man's deep purple. While I overall disagree with that statement, I can't look past how much Heap's July Morning seems a tribute to Purple's Child in Time. My two questions for you are Would you agree July Morning is Heap's Child in Time? And lastly, in the last 10 to 15 years, both bands have released strong albums. Of the more current records, which band 
would you give the edge to? Of the classic records, I prefer purple, but the more current stuff, I prefer heat. Um, I never saw July Morning as their tribute to Child in Time. I, in fact, I never even put the two songs together side by side or even compared them. Other than the fact they're, you know, kind of longer, more mellow tracks. Uh, well, not that either one really is mellow, but they have mellow sections. I don't really think they're much similar at all. So I, I don't, in fact, I don't think that Heat even thought of Child in Time when they did that song. My personal opinion. Both legendary tunes, though. As far as, like, material from the last 10, 15 years, I mean, Jesus, both have released great albums. Um, I would have to say, you might be right. I think I might give the slight edge to Heap's albums of the last decade or so. Really strong. I mean, the Purples are really strong, too. They're both great. Uh, I, you know, as we, we had another question earlier, I think that um, Purple and Heap are releasing some killer albums really here late in their career here that put a lot of younger bands to shame so it can go either way here but yeah heaps are great all right those last couple last four heap albums Oof. and our last question of the day from ninja badger hey pete can you please inform us of some good places to buy hard to find cds oftentimes amazon don't have them and ebay sellers have a bad habit of knowing they are rare and charge the earth for them i have found one in discogs could you please name some others i'm sure a lot of other viewers would find this helpful too all right, I've been asked this question numerous, numerous times and answered it numerous, numerous times, but I'll answer it again because I know it is important. Um, you can find a ton of shit on Amazon from the various sellers, okay? Um, Amazon has third-party sellers that uh, some of them are very um, reliable with good prices, and I highly recommend checking those out just because Amazon themselves don't have it in stock does not mean you can't buy it from Amazon. All right, you can go to eBay eBay's got a lot of good stuff, too, but you're right. Uh, a lot of eBay sellers tend to charge a lot of money for rare things. I will tell you, I bought a lot of stuff from Discogs. Discogs is a great place to go buy. And, again, you're mostly going to be buying stuff you know, from the international sellers. But um, you can find anything, just about. It's been very rare that there's something that I haven't been able to find here in the U.S. that I have not been able to get on Discogs for a very fair price. So I would highly recommend visiting Discogs very often. You usually can find, find like um, alternate label pressings for a lot of releases uh, that were pressed in like Germany and France and in, uh, in Russia. Nothing wrong with doing that. Okay, if it's something you really want to have, you really want to own, check out Discogs. Uh, if you're into like kind of like progressive music or like, you know, 70s uh, hard rock and, and things like that, I uh, highly recommend the Laser's Edge. Okay, Ken Golden's company. It's got a ton of stuff, really great. A selection, as well as Greg Walker's uh, symphonic music. Greg is from the West Coast. So symphonic and Laser's Edge is great. Wayside Music is another great place to go. So there's, there's so many outlets. You know, you do a Google search. You can find just about anything these days. All right? Same thing, you know, we had questions in recent weeks about finding these cool T-shirts and stuff like that. You do a Google search. You can find anything out there. Don't just think you can go to one website. It's, uh, there's so many places to buy things. So Anyway, I think that's it. Yeah, that's it, guys. So we got to squeeze a lot of questions into 33 minutes. So uh, you know how it goes, right? Put your questions for next week in the comments and feedback of this particular video. i, I got to remind some of you, some of you are putting questions for this show in, like, uh, all sorts of different places. Okay? I'm not going to read questions from a new product show to be included in this question and answer show. you got to put them in the comments of this particular show for next week. All right? Don't just go asking questions also. I had one person who was dropping in a question they wanted answered this week, and they put it in a questions and answers show from like six months ago. I'm like, I'm not going to go back and look at that stuff. So you got to do it in the, the most recent one, all right? So uh, this is on the web at www.cetranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube often, often. We got uh, a bunch of top ten songs coming up. Just got to look at my schedule and figure that out with Steve Keeler. Going to be over at Rock Fantasy uh, covering a bunch of bands. So that's coming up relatively soon, hopefully this week. And then uh, hopefully we're going to have Jeff Young on our show here over the next couple of weeks and uh, a lot of other stuff cooking. So stay tuned. Don't go away. Visit us on Facebook. Visit us on Twitter. And come back here. Subscribe. Tell your friends. And we'll see you real soon. Take care.